Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the weekly chart of Amazon.com. And you can see, let me draw some arrows in here. It go. It actually goes back to the dot-com era. You can see that it was a price of, well, it's, it's hard to see on here, but I think we had a price of about two to about 125 or so maybe 120 a 60 fold move in amazon.com before the crash and amazon is by far the best survivor of the last bubble um, a huge number i don't know what the percentage is but a very very large number of companies went bankrupt and they went to zero Amazon was not one of those, but it did lose a tremendous amount. It lost uh, somewhere around uh, 80 or 90 percent. Now, the latest move comes from a low of about 25 bucks, and you can see there were above 750. So that's a 30 fold move. Is that as big of a bubble? I think it's bigger simply because I don't think the economy has grown nearly as much as they're telling us. And uh, the, the previous one was a bubble. I think this is like a super bubble. Now let's look at one that I've looked at for a long time, expecting to crash. It hasn't yet. This is Priceline.com. And you can see that it crashed from about 1,000 all the way down to about 16. So it lost about 98% of its value in the last crash and you can see that it has run on this run up from about 20 to 1400 so that's a 70 fold move I don't have it's not on the chart here how big the move was originally but it went to a thousand so uh, again another indication that this is another unbelievable bubble that's forming that has formed and they're keeping going for we don't know how much longer, but I think that the result is going to be a spectacular crash. Now, let's look at this article from Zero Hedge. This is very, very interesting because Norway is one of those countries that we're always told is the exception. Uh, it's a successful socialist country. We know that the, the whole idea of socialism is a utterly bankrupt morally bankrupt and econ economically bankrupt idea it does not work and desperate leftists will point, point to Norway as their shining example uh, and there's a lot of explanations of why that's not correct but probably the biggest explanation is that Norway has been taking advantage of the oil that uh, the government has been selling into the market for quite some time and that's covered in this story but you can see from this chart that for the first time now they're actually dipping in to this sovereign wealth fund and the outflows are going into government uh, expenses and this is going to become very important when we start to look at the assets that are involved here and the impact it's going to have on the stock market but let's read this first Saudi Arabia isn't the only oil-dependent nation struggling to make ends meet in the wake of weak oil prices. For the first time since its establishment in 1996, the Norwegian government is starting to withdraw money from its sovereign wealth fund to cover government expenses. In fact, in the first half of 2016, the government has withdrawn $5.4 billion. Moreover, withdrawals are expected to accelerate in the second half of 2016, reaching nearly $20 billion a run rate that would have them exceeding the fiscal limits imposed on phone withdrawals of 4% of assets or $36 billion. To put those withdrawals into perspective, Norway's economy is roughly $375 billion and federal spending accounts for roughly 60% or $225 billion. Therefore, a $20 billion withdrawal in the second half of 2016 represents roughly 18% of total government spending. In an interview with Bloomberg's Egil Matson, deputy governor of Norway Central Bank, said the withdrawals are starting to impact the manner in which the fund manages its risk profile. 
quote, relevant for how we think about the risk-bearing capacity of the fund. Say you have a decline in the equity market and these returns have been partly funding the government. Do you want variations in international financial markets to have a direct impact on fiscal policy? Matson, among others, has also questioned whether the 4% fiscal limits on withdrawals are the right cap in the current return environment, noting that as older bonds be come to maturity and are reinvested, a big chunk of that will be in re- reinvested in bonds with very low or even negative yields. Matson also noted that the economic landscape has changed since their last review in 2007. Well, that might be just the understatement of the year. In response to that changing economic landscape, Matson said, that fund managers are doing a lot of internal analytical work to figure out whether the correlation structure between equities and bonds has changed since 2007. Seriously? So that's that's really hard for anyone to believe that the last time they did any analysis was nearly 10 years ago. But let's dig deeper into Norway's fund here. And we're going to start with the Wikipedia entry. And uh, they explain here that there's really two funds. They're called the Government Pension Funds. Uh, Government Pension Fund of Norway comprises two entirely separate sovereign wealth funds owned by the government of Norway. The Government Pension Fund Global and the Government Pension Fund of Norway. Now I wanted to take you down to the description of the management of this. And they are somewhat secretive about where they invest their funds but the next article i'm going to show you it's going to be pretty obvious but here you get an idea the domestic fund the government pension fund norway is managed by folketry defonet i didn't pronounce that right but close enough the global investment fund is managed by norges bank investment management part of the norwegian central bank on behalf of the ministry of finance so here's a central bank central bank buying what buying stocks as you'll see it's currently the largest pension fund in europe and is larger than the california public employees pension fund calpers one of the largest pension public pension funds in the united states in a parliamentary white paper in april 2011 the norwegian finance ministry forecast that the fund would reach 4.3 4.3 trillion Norwegian krona or 717 billion dollars by the end of 2014 and 6 trillion krona by the end of 2019 according to the forecast 2030 value of the fund would be 7.4 trillion krona or 1.3 trillion dollars a worst case scenario for the fund value in 2030 was forecast at 2.7 trillion krona or 4 455 billion dollars Since 1998, the fund has been allowed to invest up to 40% of its portfolio in the international stock market. Now, isn't that interesting? Since 1998. So, 1998 was the beginning of the blow-off top of the NASDAQ bubble. It was right when there was a correction starting and the market turned around and went parabolic and went all the way to 5,000 on the NASDAQ. Interesting that it was right then that they were freed up. Now, 40% may seem like a lot, but look what they've done since then. In June 2009, the ministry decided to raise the stock portion to 60%. In May 2014, the central bank governor proposed raising the rate to 70%. The Norwegian government planned that up to 5% of the fund should be invested in real estate, which probably is real estate stocks. So that's 75%. A specific policy for the real estate investments was suggested in a report the Swiss Partners Group wrote for the Norwegian Ministry of Finance. The fund's current investment strategy dictates 60% equities, 35% fixed income, and 5% real estate. Of the fixed income sector, 70% is invested in bonds issued by governments and 30% in the corporate sector. So 70% in, is invested in these Ponzi governments that are, we know what they're going to do. They're going to default on these bonds or inflate them away. So I tried to get more detail about what companies and uh, countries the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund invests in. And this is one article that gives us a little bit more information. This is a rare glimpse into Norwegian fund shows shift from large stakes. 
Disclosures by Norway's $877 billion oil fund offer an unusually detailed view of its workings. And this is March of this year. Oslo, Norway. Norway's $877 billion sovereign wealth fund, the world's largest, said on Wednesday that it held fewer large equity stakes at the end of 2015 than a year earlier due to gradual shift away from Europe and transfer of equity assets into its real estate portfolio. Norges Bank Investment Management, or NBIM, which manages the fund, said it held stakes exceeding 5% in 29 companies at the end of 2015, down from 57 companies a year earlier. It held stakes exceeding 2% in 1,074 companies, down from 1,205 companies. So that uh, indicates something there, not necessarily that their percentage of stock investments are going down, but the concentration of those investments in specific companies. Sounds a lot like the Dow 30 propaganda average. The annual disclosure of the Norwegian Fund's investments gives the public an unusually detailed view into how a sovereign wealth fund manages money. Similar government-owned funds that manage billions of dollars on behalf of nations from Qatar to Kuwait to China provide very little information about their activities. The large ownership stakes we've had in some real estate companies have been transferred to the real estate portfolio, said MBIM chief executive. Some of our big investments in Europe have also been reduced somewhat, so they've fallen from slightly above 5% to slightly below 5%. The fund, one of the largest investors in the world, held 1.3% of all listed global equities at the end of 2015, unchanged on the year, and held 2.3% of all listed European equities, down from 2.4%. The fund's European exposure dropped to 38.1% of its value at the end of 2015 from 39.3%. Its north its exposure to North America increased to 40% from 38.9%. Its emerging market holdings dropped to 9.8%. And it goes into them tapping into the fund. Now let's look at some of the companies here. Guess what? Here's the rogues gallery of Wall Street and central banker and bankster bandit criminals. The fund also revealed the 9,050 companies it owned shares of at the end of 2015, registering declines in its percentage stakes holdings in Credit Suisse AG and BlackRock Inc., an increase in UBS AG and HSBC Holdings, PLC. Financial companies accounted for the biggest share of equity investments at 23.4%. There you go. There's the supposedly good guy socialist government of Norway. And what are they invested in? They're invested in the Wall Street criminal banks. The fund stake in BlackRock, the world's biggest money manager, declined from 7% at the end of 2014 to 5.66% a year later. Its stake in HSBC was 1.98%. The $3 billion holding Holding in the London-based lender is the fund's second big, biggest investment in a financial company after the BlackRock stake. So right there, they, they tell you, BlackRock, the biggest stake. And I've done videos on BlackRock before. Uh, these are the, some of the biggest criminal scumbags out there in, in Wall Street. The fund stake in Zurich-based lender Credit Suisse declined from 5.69 to 4.98. In the same period, declines were also recorded at stakes in BNP Paribas, Unicredit and Intesa San Paolo. Meanwhile, it increased its stake in Swiss lender UBS from 2.94 to 3.08%. Percentage increases were also recorded in the fund stakes Barclays, Lloyds, Deutsche Bank, Nordea Bank, Standard Charter, Citigroup, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo. There you go. There is your list of criminal bankers, the ones who are manipulating gold and silver, the ones who are propping up the U.S. stock market at the behest of the Fed, the ones that get free money from the Federal Reserve and uh, probably very soon will be looting pension funds, stealing people's retirements when the whole thing goes up in smoke. So there's a perfect example for you. The supposedly friendly, neutral, wonderfully uh, good guy socialist country of Norway, they're right in bed with the bankster criminals, just like everyone else. So at some point here, 
Norway, which is probably up to 70% now equities, and probably half of those are in North America, you can bet that the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway owns Amazon.com and all the rest of the others. Let's uh, pull up BlackRock here. But when the market starts to crack, then the selling is going to be phenomenal. I think that uh, this is the beginning of the trend. I don't think uh, there's going to be a change in direction. I think when you look at the chart, here we go. Here's BlackRock, and you can see they haven't made the percentage gains, but you can see that basically from 2000, uh, they took a hit during the crisis, financial crisis, very brief hit. Of course, they probably profited tremendously from the banker bailouts and all the rest of their nefarious uh, deeds that they do. But you can see uh, since 2009, since they reflated this bubble, uh, they're up from a, about a price of 90 to 370 so uh, nearly a fourfold gain for BlackRock ultimate criminal bankers but when this thing collapses and Norway is forced to sell not only are they going to have to sell more of their stocks that they hold but the value of the stocks that they hold is going to be forced down by the selling the very same thing that took place on the way up which is people piling over each other to get into these things is going to take place on the way down as the sovereign wealth funds and the pension funds and the retirement funds all try to leave at the same time. And uh, that's when we're going to see a super crash. And we'll talk to you next time.